Okay, thank you everyone for attending this morning. Uh, good turnout, and uh, we have our guests here today as well. And uh, just to welcome everyone to the 24th meeting of the 2018 Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. Uh, agenda item one is to decide to take uh, business in private, um, is to agree to take item four in private, and this is for the committee to consider the evidence heard at agenda item three. So do members agree to take this in private? Thank you very much for that. Um, okay, agenda item two is to discuss taking business in private. And it's for the committee to agree that it's consideration of a draft report and draft changes to the code of conduct and its approach to the report from the joint working group on sexual harassment and sexist behaviour should be taken in private at future meetings. Do members agree to take these items in private at future meetings? Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. So, move to substantive items. Uh, item three is sexual harassment and sexist behaviour. And it's an evidence session with the Joint Working Group on Sexual Harassment and sexual, Sexist Behaviour. And joining us today are Susan Duffy, Duffy right, try and get your name right, Susan Duffy, um, Group Head of Committees and Outreach, and Vicky McSherry, Culture of Respect Team Leader in the Scottish Parliament. So welcome to you both, and thank you very much for coming along. And I would like to invite Susan to make a short opening statement, please. Thank you. Thanks very much, convener, and thank you for inviting us along this morning. Um, I thought I would just do a, a quick sort of um, reprise of how we've got to, to where we've got to. The SPCB set up um, the Joint Working Group on Sexual Harassment in January this year to consider and agree any actions that needed to be taken in light of the sexual harassment survey that we, we issued. I had the privilege of chairing the group and other members of the group were um, Vicky, David McGill, who's one of the Assistant Chief Executives here. We had three MSPs, Michelle Ballantyne, Rhoda Grant and Rona Mackay, two MSP staff, Gillian Mackay and Cheryl Kruger, and we also had Emma Rich from Engender. Um, I thought it would be useful maybe to give you a quick reminder of the headline survey results that while 78% of people working um, in the Parliament hadn't experienced any sexual harassment or sexist behaviour, 30% of women had experienced that behaviour. Now, it also told us that um, people weren't reporting issues and that people who'd experienced such behaviour were the least likely to have confidence in our reporting procedures. So the results of the survey, um, plus the comments that we got, and then focus groups that we subsequently set up have shaped the recommendations that the group is now putting forward. Um, we also took into account, of course, the recommendations that, that your committee made in the report you published in June this year. So what have we done? Well, when we published the results of the survey, we set out broad strands of work that the group wanted to take forward. Now, they were a programme of awareness um, and training, um, improved reporting procedures and policies, additional measures to support people who've experienced sexual harassment and mechanisms to monitor and review um, what's been put in place. On the first point about awareness raising, the Culture of Respect workshops, which everyone was asked to attend, began at the end of October, and I hope you've either all been on one or are due to go on one. Um, so far, around 700 people have uh, attended these workshops, and we've set up more sessions uh, in the new year. Um, the report that the group published last Thursday on the 13th of December sets out our recommendations to improve procedures and, crucially, to provide an independent support service for everyone. We've also set out in that report how we intend to monitor and review going forward. Um, the group issued a statement in June setting out what zero tolerance means in the Parliament. And our recommendations are designed to deliver on the principles in that statement. And those principles were to take complaints seriously and deal with them promptly and sensitively, to have transparent, easily understood policies and uh, processes, to be consistent, fair and proportionate, and to ensure that there are consequences for inappropriate behaviour. We had another guiding principle, and that was to replicate the principles of effective employment policies as far as possible. Even though we've got a number of different employment relationships within the Parliament, and of course particularly members, because of course you are not employees. Now, all of these principles underpin the recommendations that we're making in relation to complaints against the way, uh, the, the way that complaints against members should be handled. 
Now, as we have currently a system set up under statute, it's inevitable that procedures will be different for complaints against members, but we wanted to make sure that the same principles applying to complaints against anybody else would also apply to complaints against members. In summary, the main changes that we were suggesting to the way in which complaints against members could be dealt with are to remove the current one-year time limit that's in the Code of Conduct and under statute, to ensure that the complainant is given a copy of the Commissioner's report and the opportunity to comment in the same way that a member currently can, and that all complaints against members should go through the same procedure that's currently not the case at the moment. And we also ask in the report the more fundamental question about whether going forward complaints against members should be dealt with in a, a different way entirely. We're very happy to answer any questions in any of that. Well, thanks very much. Um, I think that's, that gives a good outline um, of what the report stands for. Can I ask, um, it was just last week you published, obviously, um, do you have any idea of the next steps which will be taken in terms of implementing the recommendations and also, what are the timescales involved? I'll hand over to Vicky for that. Yeah, so we've, we've started a period of consultation. That consultation is open now, and that will run until the 31st of January. Once we've had all the responses back, we'll have them analysed. The joint working group will then consider them in February. And the intention is to report back um, our findings to the corporate body in, at the beginning of March. In the meantime, on the basis of trying to you know, have something ready to go uh, once we've had final approval from the corporate body in March, we are working on getting the independent sports service up and running. So with the intention that we will be able to implement the new policy and processes at some point later in March. OK, well, that's, that's very useful, actually. Uh, people do get concerned that things go into the long grass and all that, but at least that shows that um, it's, it's moving on reasonably um, quickly. Is there anything in particular that you think this consultation will add to the processes we already have? I mean, I know it's, it's quite a wide-ranging um, thing, but is there anything that's really uh, it's going to make a big difference as people will see it? I mean, we, what we would try to do is we wanted to make it relatively focused. I mean, the reason for, for doing the consultation is that we started this off by asking everybody who works in and for the Parliament their views. So we thought it was only right before we finalised the policy to go back out to everybody to check in that they think that we've captured everything. But we have made it deliberately focused, firstly, because it's only on the, the policy. It's not, of course, on the changes to the Code of Conduct, which are of quite properly the domain of, of this committee. So really, we are just asking people um, if they think that there is anything, for example, in what we've set out, how you deal with something informally. Is there anything else that should be added to that? Is there anything else that we haven't thought about that should be considered for the way that we deal with complaints formally? And then we just give people an opportunity if there's anything else that they feel hasn't been captured in the overall, in the overall policy. So we just wanted to basically check in with people that, you know, what we're doing is going along the right lines. OK. Is there anyone wants to just add in at this point, or do you want you to wait until we can move on to the specifics? OK. Um, well, thanks very much for that. It's really useful. Can we just move on to the, uh, the using the Ethical Standards Commissioner um, and how... Uh, he or she will be involved in this. And Mark, you've got some questions on that, please. Yeah, thanks, and good morning. Um, I just wanted to ask you about the advantages and disadvantages there might be of moving away from the current procedures that we have where complaints such as this eventually come to this committee. We, we eventually consider you know, sanctions where appropriate as well. And <clears throat> I noticed the point, you obviously want us to reflect on this and reflect on um, how a change might be brought to bear but I just wondered what what your thinking was within the working group and what you saw as the advantages but if there are any downsides to that as well that, that we might need to consider um I mean one of the advantages one of the overall advantages um of um perhaps of not having complaints sort of dealt with by the uh in, within this setting that the process would be exactly the same for all complaints regardless of who the complaint is being made uh, against um Obviously, one of the things that we've tried to do with this is to take into account that we already have a code of conduct and to try and make suggestions for how the, the current code can be changed. Now, obviously, we don't, 
you know, you will obviously have to, to look at this, but we don't want to knock the code of conduct out of shape uh, in, in terms of this. Um, a disadvantage, one particular disadvantage of not having um, complaints um, taken through this process, the Commissioner um, has currently got powers under statute um, in relation to um, power to compel witnesses and documents that a non-statutory investigation um, wouldn't have. So that's one of the, the you know, the disadvantages. The other thing, it's, I don't know whether it's an advantage or a disadvantage, but it's a question in terms of if you took um, the, the commissioner and this committee out of the process, who would apply a parliamentary sanction? Um, and I think that's probably one of the, the key questions. Um, I have to say, the, I mean, the, the, the joint working group, their, their um, purpose was to try and uh, look at our current procedures and how we could make them um, sort of um, fit with the, the, the overall policy. But they, they very much um, felt that it was obviously, you know, properly for, for this committee to decide whether or not this was the, the system, the, the right system going forward. But happy to expand on, you know, some of the thinking um, around around that. Yeah, yeah. And, and the Dame Laura Cox report at, at Westminster, I think, was recommending something quite similar. And um, was did that feed into your thinking at all I mean it is a I mean it's I mean we I mean I read the uh, the Laura Cox report with with interest um, I mean there was a couple there were a couple of um, uh, different proposals that she was looking at one was that they would have their um, they would have a sort of IPSA type, type organization set up which would independently look at complaints and the second one which she seemed to favor in her report was that the standards commissioner down at Westminster would have the power to to make sanctions um, but I mean the the I would say that we've got the results of the survey up here but I, I do think that 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 the situation that we have up here is is, is different to, to to Westminster. I think there there are particular problems down at, at, at Westminster as well. How do you how do you mean? Sorry, I mean <coughs> that um, I mean all of this is in terms of harassment is to do with with power imbalances. We we know that the results of our survey up here is that um, people have experienced sexual harassment and sexist behaviour. Um, our experience though, and through talking to, um, to, to colleagues down in Westminster, I think that um, we don't have as, as um, if, if I can use the word, as deferential uh, a culture as perhaps there is down at, at Westminster. Okay, thanks for that. So in terms of what you'd want us to look at then, specifically around code of conduct, specifically around who might apply sanctions if we were to depart from this yeah. current process. Yeah. And, and an option would be to look at the powers of the commissioner and whether it was appropriate for the commissioner to apply that. Then. Yeah. Is there anything else you think we should be looking at in, in that round? I mean, I think there are a number of issues, and I would say um, up front, it's not because um, the, the system is, is broken or that there have been any um, issues um, with the system. Some of the things that, that came to us when we were looking at this um, was that we were thinking about it from the point of view of the complainant and how confident somebody would be in terms of bringing something forward in a, a political sphere. So, for example, um, one of the questions that we asked ourselves was, now, it's very obvious that um, in any report on any investigation, the complainant's identity should, should not be made known. Um, but when a report is published, even though someone doesn't see their name in the report, it still feels as though, you know, they, they know that that is them. And so we did ask ourselves a question, um, could we have a situation where we didn't publish that report? But because of the system that we have, we didn't think that you could actually say, well, we'll ask Parliament to take a decision on sanctions against a member without Parliament knowing what the basis is for that. That wouldn't happen in a normal employment um, situation. So we recognise that the report had to be published, but then we asked ourselves a question, but knowing that, will that put somebody off? And there are also issues which we can which we can talk about in terms of um, how we have some kind of sort of system of appeal and representation. And again, it was looking at it from the per perspective of the complainant and how they would feel um, you know, interacting with the, the, this committee, even though it would be in private, it can still be a daunting process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, Matt, and thank you, Susan. Um, anyone want to drop in? No. Okay. Great. Uh, can we look at uh, one of the uh, thorny issues? I think actually time limits on complaints, and I know that Elaine Smith, MSP, has some questions on that. 
Thanks very much, convener. Um, thanks for coming along, Susan and Vicky. Could I just go back one step, though, to the previous line of question and what you were saying about Westminster? Um, Susan, do you think it's just a, a power and deference issue, or is there, is there maybe more than that? Is it perhaps the, the sort of uh, male-dominated, is it a male-dominated macho culture, which this parliament maybe doesn't have to the same extent because of a more critical mass of women? Do you think that makes a difference? Yeah. I mean, the report makes clear that um, you know, a lot of this comes from structural inequalities and so therefore I think the report also talks about a lot of the work that the, this parliament is doing to try and alleviate the structural inequalities because when you do that you're, uh, um, you're absolutely right that that then has an impact on the overall um, atmosphere wi within an organisation and this parliament has, you know, has done and continues to do a lot in, in terms of looking at those structural inequalities and ensuring that in terms of of, of key bodies that um, that we take gender balance into account and that women are represented in in, in sort of key decision making uh, bodies and I suppose you've got you know two women here in, in senior positions in the in the, the parliament who've been involved in this. However, obviously, no one is being complacent about that either, and all of this work is being done and will continue to be done. Absolutely, um, no, there is there's lots more to do. Yeah, on the the, the time limits of complaints. Um, the, the, we had a brief discussion with the Commissioner about that as well. And um, under the current arrangements, um, it, the Commissioner would be obliged to seek a direction from the committee to investigate complaints that are more than one year from the date of when the complainer could reasonably have become aware of the conduct complained about. So that doesn't actually mean that there's a year limit as such. You know, it, it could be that the committee would um, give that direction sure. if asked. So I just wondered if you could talk a bit more about the reasons why you're proposing that there should be no time limit applied to complaints about sexual harassment. Sure. Just on the, the first point, um, and I think it's good that the, the committee can apply a direction. I think one of the reasons for saying that we should actually change that is not to have the, to put the committee in an invidious position where it's having to take um, a decision on a case-by-case -case basis that if we had something blanket that said actually there isn't going to be a time limit on any of the, the complaints. The reasons, the, the main reason for um, the recommendation that there should be no time limit is, I mean, we, we'd know that it's always better if people can try and raise complaints, um, you know, as, as soon as possible after something's happened where everything's fresh in people's minds. But we know, particularly with this type of complaint, that it can be really, really difficult for people to do that. Now, it might be because they um, they feel that they're they're powerless to do something about it. If it's somebody in a position of authority or power over them, they, they are um, frightened to come forward, frightened that they won't be believed, and frightened that the overall culture um, is not going to help in terms of, of that. And so I think there have been instances where women have now come forward where they have felt either that they're in a position now where they, they, they feel more confident in bringing something forward or that they feel that things have changed so that they might be believed and that they're not going to be blamed for, for, for something or that they see someone is going on to do you know, an, another job and they want to, to highlight this. But I think with these types of, of complaint, it can be extremely difficult for people to pluck up the courage to bring that forward. And because we're trying to put in place a system where it's easier for people to come forward, where people will feel more confident, we thought that it would seem contradictory to then say, but essentially there is a time limit. And we did think if you got rid of the, the one year time limit, should we put a time limit in at all? And we decided against that because we thought any time period would be essentially arbitrary. What we do recognise is that what will have to be taken into account with any investigation is how far back the allegations go, whether it was something that was a one-off, whether it continues the serious seriousness of it, um, how much people can remember about what happened, but that would all be taken into account into the investigation as to whether or not there was a case to, to answer. Yes, and I suppose, uh, I think we've maybe come to it later about what the sanctions might be, and particularly if, if it was ex-members, for example. Um, but I just wondered on that, that if, you know, if it's not entirely clear whether the complaint relates to sexual harassment before it's been looked into, then would there be situations where it could be difficult to determine on initial inspection 
and would that, how would that affect the time limits? Sure. This was also something that we were um, grappling with. Um, we took a, I mean, we, we took a, a decision when we started this that we wanted to focus on sexual harassment specifically rather than bullying and harassment more generally because, as we've just spoken about, the issue of structural inequality and power imbalance um, plays out very much uh, in relation to sexual harassment and sexist behaviour and there are particular interventions that we need to, to look at for that. But we also recognise that what we are um, putting in place, if when we are then reviewing our procedures on harassment and bullying more generally, those procedures are probably going to look fairly similar to what we've got. Uh, and sorry, in terms of what we're proposing for, for sexual harassment. And that was why in the report we were inviting the committee to consider whether if you, were look, if you were perhaps looking at having to make a separate class of complaint, rather than just making it on sexual harassment, did you want to make it uh, slightly wider in relation to perhaps the treatment of others, um, which would kind of future-proof the code of conduct for the time when we then revise our procedures on harassment and bullying more generally? That's a long way of, of saying, in terms of the question that you've asked, if you did it in that way, then there would be less likelihood for something to fall between two stools because that's the last thing that we want is for a complaint not to be taken forward because, because we're not sure whether it's sexual harassment or whether it's um, bullying and we don't want something to fall between two stools. Or if I might just explore slightly further, do we have and time? And then guilt, and then yes, guilt okay. Passion. So I suppose um, thinking about it, and I know we're going to be talking about... Um, ex-members if you like but thinking about that we you, you mentioned the culture of respect workshops at the beginning susan um so ex-members won't have had the opportunity to do that so in some ways the culture of the parliament will change you know no matter whether it's been better or worse than other places it, it will change because of that so i suppose and under the the sexual harassment um policy that you've, you've put the annex to the report you talk about things like invasion of personal space. I think, you know, I suppose I'm wondering how grey areas might then be dealt with, because the kind of thing I'm thinking is, a uh, number of years ago, maybe there's an ex-member who thought it was appropriate to give everybody a cuddle that they came across, and now we might not consider that to be entirely appropriate at all, depending on who it is, what the circumstances are, etc. if you've been on the workshops and thought about it. So how, and you specifically talk about invasion of personal space. So how, you know, how would that kind of thing be dealt with, do you think, given that the culture may have been very different five or ten years ago? One thing I would say is in terms, and um, our code of conduct, and again, we were talking about Westminster, and unlike Westminster, our code of conduct from the, the beginning has mentioned sexual um, harassment specifically. Now, it never um, described in detail what that was, but it talked about sexual harassment. We obviously have definitions under the law of, of sexual harassment and we've had a, a you know a culture from the beginning of treating people with, with respect. Now what we're trying to do now is to, to just try and put a bit more uh, detail um, into those definitions and to be honest, a lot of what we're talking about now was I would uh, I would argue even five years ago was was still unacceptable um, then, even though it's now that we are we are specifying that. Um, and, you know, the, the question that you are, you're talking about there, I mean, context is, is, is everything. And it goes back to the whole power imbalance. There are, you know, I, I might give Vicky a cuddle when we, when we go out here, and that's, and that's absolutely fine, isn't it? Yeah, that's, uh, that's fine. Um, but... If I were to do that with uh, a, a, you know, a member of, of, of my staff when I'm in a position of authority over them, that's very different. OK, I think it's, it's interesting, and particularly the ex-members issue, which we're probably going to come on to more about a little bit later. Thanks, convener. Thank you very much for that, Elaine. Ed, Gil Patterson, please. <laughs> if I'd, I've got a couple of questions further on, but um, this is a particular one that uh, ha hasn't been raised yet. In terms of perhaps, uh, you know, the party systems that are in operation and there's maybe an investigation within the party, and no matter what the outcome is, that because now what's been proposed is uh, no time limit. So should uh, a case go before a party and a, an individual is cleared and then somewhere down the line I, the complainer complains through this process, what, what actually would happen? So a complaint that's been dealt with previously. 
Yes. Yeah. Um, By the party system, specifically. I suppose we, if we're giving people the opportunity to, to raise their concerns through this new policy, then we need to give them the opportunity to raise them. And it goes through the process. We've got a different process in place. We've got an independent investigator. It goes through that process. Um, I, I suppose once it's been through the independent investigator, it then goes back to... Um, the party or the employer or whoever it is that's that's making that complaint. Um, I don't see that... I think because it's a different process and we've been more explicit about what the, um, the, the expectations of behaviour, it would have to be tested against the standards that are in that new process and the new policy. And th this, uh, my question here, um, and the line I'm going on now would be two factors included, including the, the, the change to the time. So if you keep that in mind. And I, the, my question is simply this. The, the JWG has concluded that it might be considered appropriate uh, for the complaints of a se sexual harassment to be treated as a separate class of complaint and uh, we're looking for what the reasons were. And, but I'm particularly concerned because uh, at the last meeting of this committee, the commissioner had came before us, and the question in relation to that had come up in regards to differentials. So what we're proposing here is a dif differential in two, two areas, the time limit uh, and then the categories. So we're, we're, got a, we're having different from what we have at present time, we will have a separate category for action in regards to sexual harassment. However, um, I think there's one or two around this table would, would express difficulty, uh, and the Commissioner talks in law about the difficulties that this creates, and I can, I can read that quote out, but it, he's concerned about having differentials. But for people to make, you know, not to, for, for instance, if there was no, if there was a time limit on someone that had been verbally abused or maybe physically attacked, and for the same reasons, and it might be the same people, they don't come forward within the year. But this would, uh, to me, uh, or, uh, and it looks like the Commissioner, would be unfair because we are defining something that one inappropriate behaviour is different from another equally serious matter for individuals. So I wonder how we, how we can square that circle. In terms of a, a separate um, category, I mean, in the last point that you, you made, I mean, I, I agree, and I think that's why we were um, saying that if you if you were, and I'll come back to the separate category, that if you were to create a separate category, um, would it be better for it to be something broader, such as the treatment of others? It's it's about somebody's behaviour, whether that's sexual harassment, whether that's harassment or, or bullying. And the reason that we um, suggested that you might want to look at a separate category is really just because, I suppose it's a question back to you, as to whether the changes that the, the group is proposing that we think um, need to be made to ensure that we can have the same principles applying to complaints taken against members in relation to their, to their behaviour, um, whether you then feel that that should the, those changes, because we think those changes need to be made, if you think that it, that, that should also apply across the board to other complaints that you deal with under the under the Code of Conduct. And, you know, and I think obviously that's for this committee to take a, a decision on, but that's why we suggested that if perhaps you thought that by applying what we're looking at across the board and it might not be appropriate for all of the different types of complaints that you have to deal with, whether that's members' interests, you know, or, or um, issues about um, confidentiality, I don't know. But that's why we thought that... Um, one option was to create this separate category because what we're talking about here is the way is people's behaviour. It's a, a, diff a different type of complaint. Yeah, I, I, I can understand that. that, that I mean, there's clearly a, a difference. Uh, but the impact can be the very same uh, on the individual. Uh, but I wondered if uh, the 
group that were looking at this uh, uh, took evidence on that or looked at that specifically how it would in fact impact on uh, it's not in any way by the way I should say it's not in any way to say that what's been proposed has not to be dealt with these are very serious issues but my kind of line of questioning is there are other very very serious issues uh, that, that we in this parliament need to deal with so it's when you separate them but I wondered if, if any thought uh, and a discussion and investigation into the impact of this if this committee didn't make changes uh, in the way that you're suggesting to the other elements of the, the code of conduct that would bring them into a kind of holistic fashion for all a, 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 a kind of inappropriate action mm -hmm. um, basically when we looked at the, the code of conduct um, and when we're thinking about complaints and as I say in this case it's sexual harassment but complaint you know complaints generally about bullying and, and harassment um, if we're looking at this from the point of view of trying to put the complainant at the centre of the, the process there are there are issues within the code of conduct which um, kind of jump out at you that don't put the complainant at the at the centre of the of the process so that for example um, or that don't afford the, the complainant the same uh, the, the same rights as the respondent. So, for example, the fact that a member who's complained about will be given a copy of the commissioner's report, but it currently um, the person who complains doesn't get a copy of the report or the ability to make representations. Um, the other issue is that the way the code is written at the moment, our policy is saying that if people want to, people can try and resolve an issue informally, and we would encourage people to do that where appropriate. But sometimes it might not be appropriate to do that. A person might not feel comfortable. Something might be too serious. And what we're saying very clearly is that people do not have to have gone through all of the informal processes before they take a formal complaint. Um, in Section 9, in relation to excluded complaints, the way it's written at the, at the moment, what that tends to what that suggests is that people would have to go through lots of informal procedures before they actually could have a, a formal complaint taken to the commissioner and also that that decision and that would be for SP, you know complaints from SPC, members of SPCB staff or member staff um, that the decision then on whether to refer that complaint formally to to the commissioner and to this committee would be taken by the SPCB rather than the commissioner themselves so that was our thinking behind why we said that we thought that the code of conduct had to, to change. But as I say, that is in relation to um, complaints about somebody's behaviour because it's around the issues of natural justice, around the issues of the, the, the complainant feeling that their voice uh, needs to be heard. Now, it is then a question for this committee as to whether you think that's then appropriate for other types of complaint that you deal with. And as I say, I'm not talking about... Be complaints about somebody's behaviour here. I'm talking about, for example, you know, breach of the members' um, interests act, some, you know, something like uh, something like that. Okay, thanks for that. Thank you, Gail. Um, and uh, to open this a, a wee bit wider, I would get Maureen Watt, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you, convener. Morning, folks. Um, Elaine uh, sort of alluded to um, former members and what what might happen. So what do you think are the challenges uh, of establishing the findings and conclusions of historical cases? I mean, I think there are... Um, sorry, I'm aware <laughs> I've just jumped. Feel free to just jump in. Uh, there, um, um, the, some of the disadvantages are that memories can fade over over time. Um, that uh, there might be, you know, confusion over over dates and and and, and facts. Um, some documents might not be um, available anymore. So I think there, you know, potentially are uh, difficulties in in relation um, to that. And I think what would play into that as well is basically whether that whether what happened was how serious it was and whether it was one off or or recurring as well because if it's something more serious and if it's something that's recurring then you know people are probably more likely to be able to recall that than for example a one off um, sexist comment that was made say 10 years 10 years ago so what then do you think is the merit in carrying out investigations into former members and then i suppose the main thing is what can then usefully 
uh, be done with the outputs of such an investigation. Yeah. I mean, and the policy would also apply to, for example, a former member of staff as well, and that's just a consequence of not having the, the, the time limit. Um, I mean, I think we recognise that... Um, the, the issue of sanctions then comes up because in the case of a member, the member is no longer a member of this parliament, so you can't apply parliamentary sanctions. For a member of our staff, we couldn't um, undertake any disciplinary proceedings because they don't work here. But I think a couple of the, the, the reasons for doing this is, one, it could actually, particularly if this is somebody who has been thinking about taking a complaint for a long time, it's a way of perhaps giving them closure or a way of giving them the opportunity to be heard. Also, it can be a way of um, the organisation um, learning lessons. So whilst we appreciate you can't then uh, proceed to a sanction, you know, a disciplinary sanction, perhaps for those reasons, um, you know, we can learn lessons. And as I say, the person can perhaps feel closure that their complaint has been listened to and investigated. Can I just ask more generally, when um, a person complains, how, at what stage is the person who's complained against informed? And it's, this is especially important if such a thing is played out in front of the press, that it is in public um, domain. So how soon is, um, for want of a better word, the accused um, informed and, and what kind of, how is that done? In terms of through our new process um, and wh where we're using our independent investigators, so not in relation to members, then as soon as that investigation starts, as soon as that uh, complaint is received, then the, the, the individual is, is told that there's a complaint being received. In relation to members, I'm not sure. I mean, in relation to members, the the commissioner, when uh, as far as when the commissioner receives uh, a complaint, the commissioner will contact the person against whom the complaint has been has been made, so that they will know first of all that a complaint has been made against them, and then subsequently they will obviously be invited to to come in to uh, to to be told about the nature of the allegations uh, against them and to respond to those those allegations. And what training? Do does anybody involved in this process have to distinguish between real complaints and vexatious complaints? Well, in terms of the obviously we for for our new process we are going to appoint uh, uh, an independent investigator to investigate uh, complaints against staff, um, and they we will be going through a full procure, procurement process for that. So it will be. Um, experienced um, and qualified uh, people who do these investigations all the time. So obviously they will be brought up to speed with our processes, what the standards are that we expect in terms of the standards of behaviour. And these are people that come from predominantly from an HR or a legal background. So this is what they do all the time, if you like. Um, in terms of the commissioner, um, I don't know, I'm assuming that there's some kind of training that goes on um, in relation to the commissioner and his staff. I mean, obviously, the, the commissioner staff are, you know, trained in investigation. But what the report makes um, quite clear is that recognising the the nature of uh, of these um, complaints, that it should also investigators should also have the skills to be able to be inquisitorial without being adversarial and to deal with things appropriately and sensitively. Now, we would obviously specify that. Uh, in the contract that we would be tendering and what I think the report says for the, the commissioner is that the commissioner would need to satisfy themselves that they had within their, their, their staff the, the skills and abilities to be able to carry out the complaints on, on that basis so that they will have the skills of investigators but also the skill to deal with these types of, of complaints sensitively and appropriately. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, Maureen. Thanks uh, to our guests also. Um, can we move on to anonymity? Uh, and this is a, an important uh, part of the report. And uh, Tom Mason has some questions there. Yes, thank you. Um, a difficult process, but an, uh, an anonymity requires to be maintained main, most of the time. But in, how soon and what is the balance between telling the, compa the, the respondent that there is a problem and not identifying who that person is? complainer is 
And it, it's, it's a difficult balance, but at some stage that has to happen. Otherwise, natural justice doesn't take place. I mean, you're right, it's a really difficult balance. And um, one of the reasons that we um, we talk about this in the report is because the, um, what we, the feedback that we got from the survey was that one of the barriers um, to people reporting was that uh, they were worried about anonymity, they were worried about confidentiality. So we wanted to be quite upfront about what people could expect. Now, we completely appreciate that... Um, that particularly where you're talking about a power imbalance, a person who's making a complaint, you know, might not want the person that they're complaining about to, to, to know about that, but you make a point about natural justice. In, ca in, in cases such as these, um, well, in any case, um, anybody who's accused of anything has to have the opportunity to be able to respond to that. Now, with these types of complaints, that that means knowing the full details and that is probably going to mean um, knowing the identity of the person who has made the complaint. I would stress so that that doesn't mean then that, that the identity of that person shouldn't be kept confidential. It has to be kept confidential to those who have a legitimate um, right to, to know. Now there might be some occasions if you're dealing with an issue informally. So for example, if a member of my staff came to me and said that someone had uh, had behaved in a sexist manner had, or, um, uh, towards them, um, but they didn't want to do anything about it. Now, it might be that I've, I've heard that from somebody else as well. And if I'm dealing with that informally, I might, as a manager, be able to just go and speak to that person and to have a word without having to actually say who had made the, the complaint. Um, so there could be some circumstances where you're dealing with things informally where you don't have to make known to the um, to the person being complained about the identity of the complainer. But it gets very different territory when you're getting into uh, making a formal complaint. And as we say in our, our report, um, and again to manage people's expectations, um, really the only circumstances where you are, uh, where you wouldn't, uh, the respondent wouldn't be um, told the identity of the person making the complaint in a formal situation is in an extreme um, situation where, for example, there was a concern over the, uh, the safety of an individual. And as I say, it is a difficult balance because we want to get rid of as many barriers as possible, but we also need to make sure that the process is robust and is fair to both parties. But carrying on from that, if a complaint comes in and it, it, you know is dealt with informally in the first place, but but then leads to a series of complaints, maybe two different pe to, to different people, for the same person perhaps, or for multiple person. I mean, how how do you log that and how do you keep that logical and within the, within the domain of the total as opposed to just held by individuals? I think, as Susan says, if something is proceeding to a formal complaint and someone has, has taken out a formal complaint... Um, That's the key part. Yeah. Well, not necessarily. Um, I think if it's going down that route, then you, it's, you can't really do that on an anonymous basis. If, if there's going to be a formal investigation taking place, then the person who's responding to that complaint needs to know who the individual is. You need to have the details, you need to have the, uh, you need to be able to respond to that um, complaint, therefore you need to have the details of it. And I think as Susan had said, the details of that include the name of the person. Um, I think maybe what, what, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think maybe what you're talking about there is if there's, if, um, someone hasn't made, hasn't taken forward a formal complaint but has maybe logged in some way so when we have our support service set up people will be able to contact that on an anonymous basis just to speak to somebody so they don't have to give their name and um, they maybe just want to talk to somebody they maybe just want to log somewhere and come back to it again in the future so they may log at that point and they may not want to give their name at that point if it then proceeds to a, a formal complaint, I think at that point we would expect people to, to have to put their name to it, really. Well, you, you say log, but how, how can that be how can that be done effectively to collect the, you know, the whole organisation? I mean, you're dealing with the whole domain, and there may be complaints and comments being made to different managers in different places. Well, this, this would be done through an independent support service, because I appreciate in terms of... Um, it is difficult to collect data across the piece of people who are just coming and having a, a chat with their, their manager. Where we're, <clears throat> where we're looking at um, 
we will be able to, to log things centrally is through the independent support service which is available to everybody and we're encouraging people to contact that service um, regardless of whether or not they want to take forward a complaint they might just want to talk something through with somebody but will the the respondent in that case know that this log is being kept it do, 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 do will they have access to that I mean, at some point, I mean, if if, you're, if I'm sitting there with dozens of complaints, am I not entitled to know that I am getting complaints against me? I mean, heaven forbid, but... I think, I mean, <laughs> I suppose when we're talking about a, a, um, a log, that is, a, you know, a log of people who have, who have uh, phoned up, um, who have um, had an issue... Um, with somebody, but they're not logging, if you like, at that stage, a formal complaint because if they were, then yes, we would tell the, the, the respondent. Um, one of the things that we are um, looking at is because we know that one of the barriers to people coming forward is that they might feel um, they don't want to be the person that puts their head above the, the parapet. So um, we are going to explore with our independent support service how we can have some system whereby if... Um, if a number of people are, are logging concerns about the, the same person, now, no action will be taken on the, on the, the back of that. It can't be. But what we're looking at is, is whether there's, there is some way, and it would have to be in a confidential and secure way, that um, the, the, the person um, who's operating the system can go back to the per people who have complained and said, look, you're not the only person who's made a complaint and that allows them to think about whether they want to take for, uh, further uh, action or not. Now, that's very complicated because there are lots of things that we have to, um, a lot of safeguards that we have to put in place in relation to that, and the issue of fairness comes forward again. This is something that's still relatively new. It's been um, trialled by a few um, universities uh, in, the, in the States. Um, I think the, the EHRC... And they had a, a recent report, and I think the Department of Justice is looking at something like this as, as well. But it is complicated because there are issues about fairness, there are issues about data protection, so we don't have the answers at this point, but this is something that we want to explore further. Okay. Just before Elaine uh, Gill, did you want to follow up? You okay, Elaine, please, thanks. You know, just a, a supplementary on that then, um, Susan, you mentioned data protection. So I could see that being an issue because if you're keeping information about someone with their name against it, then that person would surely be allowed to come to you and, and ask to see what's being held with their name against it, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's one of the things that we need to investigate. But my understanding of this is a piece of software um, and my understanding is that it, it encrypts it so it doesn't actually record the individual's... It's not a complaint recorded against the individual's name. It's all coded in some way. I don't, it's all a bit technical. I'm not going <laughs> to pretend that I know what it means. Um, but, yeah, so there are... It, we need to look at it further, but there are... It, obviously, that's a big factor in terms of data protection and stuff, so... I'm taking some advice in, in terms um, of that and if we can have some kind of system where it is encrypted like that, where it is a code rather than a person's name, then um, you know we that should help in terms of data protection, but we will obviously not put in place anything that would go against natural justice or would go against data protection or GDPR. Uh, you, you would have problems with disclosure if, you, if that person had been responded you know, at some point and wants a disclosure document. It would be one of the places one would look to, to have that confirmed or otherwise. Would that not, not be the case? I mean, these are all the questions that we're going to have to look at in the, the round, and we've, we've been um, we've been consulting with our, um, our legal team on this, and we'll, we'll continue to do that on, on, on that basis because um, you you know you're right. People can make a, a, a request um, for uh, for disclosure about records that are held about them. So these are the kind of th the issues that we're going to have to to look at. And as I say, that's one of the reasons that we're looking at, at this particular system because rather than a person's name showing up. It, and, and, and being obvious to, 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 to others, it is encrypted. But there are. this is why, um, by, at this stage, we haven't got a final solution to this, because it is difficult because, for all of the reasons that you mentioned. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, and, and thanks to the guests. I can move on, please, to access to an opportunity to comment on the Commissioner's report. And uh, I know that Jamie Halcrow-Johnson has a question or two there, please. Can I just ask very quickly on the last point? I mean, recognising that it could be encrypted, but I take it you can confirm that this wouldn't be subject to freedom of information request? 
we would check that out, but we we would not want that to be subject to, but we would have to make sure that we were doing yeah. it in such a way that it, because then that would just undermine what it is that we're trying to do. So. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you very much, Convener, and formally good morning to you. Um, uh, as mentioned, this is about to access and the opportunity to comment on, on the draft report. And when the Commissioner gave evidence to us uh, recently, he expressed a preference that... Um, the opportunity for the, the, the complainant um, uh, or comments from the complainant um, to be made was at the uh, stage of findings in fact, not when there was a draft report which would include uh, finding in facts and conclusions. So I was just wondering uh, if you could comment on that and provide more detail on the approach that you recommend. Um, as I said at the, the beginning, we tried to have the overarching principle that um, we would... Uh, approach things in a very similar way regardless of who the complaint is against so the starting point for this is thinking about what would happen in an employment situation now if there was an investigation um, in an employment situation um, the respondent the complainant any witnesses um, they would be given the opportunity to review their, their witness statements to see that factually then that was that was correct um, but crucially what the complainant would have is once the investigator has come to a conclusion and it is given to the decision-making body to decide whether or not to uphold the, the complaint. If, for example, if at that stage the decision was not to uphold the complaint, then the person who'd made the complaint would have the opportunity to appeal that. Um, now, that was our starting point, so that's where I probably differ slightly um, from the, the commissioner, because I think if you just had the opportunity for someone to comment on findings and facts, but not on the conclusions, then we're missing out in, in effect that appeal um, process because I think it's absolutely right that people are given the opportunity to, to clarify that something is factually correct but for example if the commissioner then concludes that, sec that sexual harassment hasn't taken place but the complainant thinks that there are reasons why that, that, is actually, that is wrong then we think that they should be able to make representations on those conclusions. Now, although we've tried to make this um, fully analogous with a normal grievance procedure, we know that we can't because to be fully analogous with a grievance procedure would mean that the complainant would be able to not only make a written representation but appear in front of you and you as a committee would act as some kind of appeal hearing. That, Well, for two reasons. One, you know, your committee was never set up to act in that way. And secondly, that can be really quite uh, testing for, for someone having to, to do that. So what we're suggesting in the report is for the complainant to be able to make a written representation. But I do think it is really important because if at that stage we say there is no, no case to answer, then there's nowhere else for the complainant to go and they have to have the opportunity to appeal that. Now, the person against whom the complaint is taken has the opportunity later on to appeal because in an employment situation, if action is then taken against them, they have the opportunity to appeal against that, to appeal against any sanction, as does a member. But we think it's critical for natural justice that a complainant has the opportunity to appeal against uh, a, f a finding, a conclusion, and that would be a conclusion as to whether or not there had been a breach of the of the code. Okay, uh, and is that situation or the procedures or the processes altered if if both parties take issue with um, uh, either the contents of each other's statements or with the report itself? I mean, with with these kinds of uh, complaints, there will always be. Uh, there will always be a case where people will interpret differently what, what others have said. Now, we were talking earlier on about the skills of investigators, and that's why investigators need to be skilled, because particularly with these types of complaints, investigators will need to, to weigh up, um, because the standard of proof is the balance of probabilities. Investigators will have to weigh up differing interpretations of, of what has happened and to come to a, a, a conclusion. Rarely with these types of complaints... Um, are they easy to investigate and where there is a, a and where there is a, a very very easy answer yeah I think um, so in terms of the the investigator I think and uh, you know I don't know not to to put words into the commissioner's mouth but I think he he had indicated that you know it becomes then very difficult when you're sitting with all this different evidence you've got all these different I think that's going to be the case in these types of situations anyway. That's exactly what it's like. It's always, as Susan says, it comes down, it will 
potentially 99% of the time it comes down to one person's word against the other and it's just, it's. I suppose that's the role of the investigator, investigator isn't it? It's to sit there and say, right, here's that person's view, there's that person's view. There's not necessarily going to be lots of other witnesses, there's not going, necessarily going to be lots of other evidence and it will come down to, you know, making a decision based on that. Um, and then, so I suppose if to... to, to to give the respondent um, more of an opportunity to input to that, but not giving that same level of opportunity to the complainant just doesn't really sit very well. It doesn't feel right. OK, thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Um, and on another angle on this, um, Maureen Watt, please. Yes. Um, so, yeah, just to follow on that, the committee... Uh, as you know, has been conducting work to tighten the confidentiality provisions. So I suppose I'm asking, do you foresee any risks to the confidentiality of processes if the complainant had access to the commissioner's report before the committee completed its deliberations? I mean, I, I appreciate that. I mean, obviously, at the moment, if... Uh, if a member who's complained about if, um, if if they breach that confidentiality, then this committee can obviously take uh, the, the, a complaint can be made and the committee can take action against a member. I appreciate that you will not be able to take action in that sense uh, if a complainant was to breach um, confidentiality. If it was, for example, a member of, of our staff, then um, breaching confidentiality would potentially be a disciplinary uh, offence. But I think whilst yes if you've got you know if you've got two people with a report as opposed to one person then potentially you've got twice the risk of of of, uh, of something being leaked but i think for me the balance is that the complainant has to be given a copy of the the report for natural justice so for me i i i mean I think we make the, the point very, very clearly that the co confidentiality has to be respected. Um, you know, we, we, you know, I think as, as the report says, we, we work in an organisation which is not like other organisations where things are subject to, to media scrutiny and confidentiality is always important and it's vitally important um, here. So, and I know this committee takes that very seriously. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, thank you. Um, can we just move on to excluded complaints, please? And um, uh, you, the JWD report recommends that complaints against a member um, about treatment of staff, any member of staff across the parliamentary uh, area, should no longer be excluded from the Commissioner's remit. Um, so what would be the effect and or advantages of no longer excluding complaints about a member um, in terms of how this affects both the staff and the MSPs? I mean, the way the Code of Conduct is written at the moment um, is that where you've got a complaint coming from a member of um, SPCB staff or where it's a, a, a member's member of staff, that um, that will be looked at by the relevant business manager or by the HR office. In a sense, this is kind of this is kind of covered by a in our policy, what we're describing is how you would look at things on an informal basis and that if someone came to us and wanted to deal with something informally, they may want to, to deal with it themselves, they may want to talk to the person's line manager, but it also may be that they want to talk to HR and that if it is a, a member that um, somebody from HR or me as a manager would go and have a word with the relevant business manager. Um, so I think, firstly, the code doesn't uh, will now not reflect what the the situation is with with the policy, but the really crucial thing for me in this is again that the way the code is currently written is that it, for those kind of complaints for that then to be dealt with by the commissioner you would have to have gone through all of those what we would see as informal processes before a formal complaint could actually be taken, and also it's the SPCB which would refer any complaint. And again, that takes it away from the complainant themselves and goes against the overarching policy where we're saying you don't have to have gone through all of these informal processes if you want to take a formal complaint and it is your choice. Yeah. Well, that makes sense to me. Thank you. Um, so you've held up remarkably well, actually, throughout this. Can we move on to a final area and that's the treatment of visitors to the parliament. Um, did the group give any consideration to recommending that members 
should be held to a standard of behaviour in relation to the people that they encounter in the context of their parliamentary duties uh, within Parliament um, and how that should be treated under the code. I mean, when the, the Joint Working Group was looking at this, what we wanted to do was to make sure that we were clear about standards of behaviour that would apply to everybody who works in or for the Parliament. And that standard of behaviour should apply regardless of who people are interacting with. To be honest, when we were looking at this, we probably thought at the time that the Code already did cover uh, members' treatment of, of witnesses. But I think um, looking at the, the, the code, it possibly doesn't. And I don't see any reason why it wouldn't. So that, for example, um, on uh, the non-MSP side of things, if, um, if someone comes here and believes that they've been treated badly by a member of, of staff, there is, a there is already a complaints procedure um, that they can go through where they can take a complaint against that, that member of staff. Now, if somebody came to me and, uh, and said that a member of my staff had been sexually harassing somebody, then I would probably then go through the procedures that we're talking about now to investigate um, that and to take a, a decision on that. So again, if we're looking to apply the same principles, then I would see no reason at all why the Code of Conduct wouldn't then make clear that that standard of behaviour is expected of um, a, a member's treatment of a, of a visitor um, to the Parliament and that they could also take a complaint under the Code if they feel that they have um, been treated inappropriately. Okay, that seems reasonable. Uh, Jamie Alcro Johnson, please. Yeah, thanks very much. Not, re not related to that. Um, you mentioned right at the beginning you talked about the culture respect workshops that were taking place in training. I think 700, over 700 people attended, and I attended one yesterday. I just wanted to know um, what feedback, uh, or how you were monitoring basically the feedback from people that had attended that, uh, and also how you'll be um, analysing, monitoring the impact of the workshops. Yeah, so we've got, um, everyone fills in an evaluation sheet whilst they're there, so we're taking the feedback from that, we're collating all that. Once the workshops are finished, then we'll analyse them. Um, we've we, we had feedback as we were going along, so we kind of, we... Uh, made minor changes to the workshops after the first few sessions um, and have done that sort of to an extent as we've gone through it. Um, I mean, obviously, we've talked about the, the, the training is just the first step. It's about changing the culture. So we need to um, look to the longer term and look at the impact of that, whether it's changing, what, what changes are taking place. So we've got a wee bit more work to do, I think, in the joint working group in terms of what measures we're going to put in place, how we are going to measure it, um, whether at some point, you know, once the, the, the policy's been in place for, for a while, whether we look to um, then come back to the, the parliamentary community again, ask similar questions, see if there's been any change. Um, one of the measures that will definitely be in place that we don't have really just now is so we, we, the independent support service will be collating a lot of data for us. It will be collating stats in terms of number of complaints, number of contacts they get. So that will give us data that we don't currently have. So yes, there are plans to 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 measure um, the change. Oh, difficult though that may be, I think. But yeah, absolutely. Going back to the evaluation of the actual workshops themselves, how confident, I mean, the workshops are 15 maximum. They are, the, the, the feedback is semi-anonymous. I don't know if you can have semi-anonymous, but you see what I mean. You're one of a small group of people and, and where you sit within the parliament structure is, is recorded in that. How um, confident are you that, that the feedback that given will be entirely honest, accurate and constructive or... Um, or that people will feel confident enough to highlight concerns, or whether you know whether they felt it really was uh, relevant, or what extra additionals they might like to have seen, because it was simply circling. I don't know if I'm revealing anything uh, amazing here, but it's simply circling one to five in terms of response. It's not the opportunity. I'm sure we could provide opportunity, but an opportunity to say, actually, I thought this was good, but that wasn't good, or this needs to be done better. To be fair, the the the. the where people have been completing the sheets, they have been writing quite a lot of comments on the bottom. There's a free text bit on the bottom. So there has been quite a lot of, you know, uh, constructive uh, feedback. I mean, one of the things that has came through quite strongly is that um, people have appreciated the fact that they're mixed groups. Um, you know, it aren't, it would, there aren't groups just for MSPs, there aren't groups just for staff. And I think that has been really useful in... Um, 
starting a conversation in terms of sharing different views and even just for different um, you know different groups to hear the views of others <laughs> has been really useful and that's some of the, f the feedback that we've had from it I mean it will be we, because we then we need to look at well what what do we need to do next um, and what if is there any further training required so you know there will certainly be an exercise once we've got these workshops done and out of the way um, in terms of you know, taking all that feedback. We may even have to go back to people again and ask for further feedback. We might have another couple of focus groups specifically on the training and say, well, what, what can we do? What, what, step, what are the next steps that we can take? The diversity of the people in there and the backgrounds and the roles was actually really important. So mm. thank you for both. Thank you very much. And just finally from Elaine Smith, please. Thank you. Thanks, Convener. I actually want to ask you something specifically about um, the conclusion. But before I do, could I just explore slightly further... Um, this is an unusual workplace. I think all workplaces have politics, as we know, office politics and power situations. But it is quite an unusual workplace because I suppose sometimes people looking at what goes on in the chamber might not think there's much of a culture of respect at all. And that can just be the cut and thrust of, of political debate. But the other side of that as well is that members... Um, I mean, reputational damage is important to anyone, but to members it's particularly important in that that could be the end of their political career. Um, for other people in the working environment, it might, it might mean um, training, etc. And, you know, they may still keep their job, but reputational damage would be very difficult for members, some members to recover from, depending on the situation. So if vexatious complaints are made, how are those to be dealt with? I mean, we're very clear in the in the policy that um, any vexatious or malicious complaints will be taken very seriously. I mean, we don't ex we expect that to be to be rare, um, but we are very clear as we are with um, any other um, policies that we've got at the moment, whether it's a grievance policy or not, that vexatious or malicious complaints will be taken very seriously. And if someone is found to have made a vexatious or a malicious complaint, then you know they will be disciplined and and and, and dealt with. Um, Going back to your, your point about reputational damage, that again I think is one of the, the, the reasons why confidentiality is so important for both the complainant and the, the, the respondent. Because if someone makes a vexatious complaint, um, then there is no case to answer. Now if that has been kept confidential, then you know, it's less likely that someone's reputation is, is going to suffer because that then hasn't um, made it into the public domain. So again, that is why, as I say, it's so very important that any investigation, investigatory process can go ahead without the glare of publicity and, and done in confidence. Okay. And finally, convener on the um, conclusions, number 141 on the report. You say that you recognise there are some tricky issues for the committee to consider and that we'd need time to do this and um, talk about it might be a need to make legislative change as well as changes to the code of conduct. So we may wish to consider in the intervening period whether transitional arrangements need to be put in place. Could you elaborate a bit on those transitional arrangements or what, what your idea of that is? Sure. I mean, just as one example, going back to what we were talking about earlier, about the one-year time limit, and of course, as, as you said, um, the, com the committee can currently issue a direction um, to the uh, to the commissioner. So, I mean, I know that uh, in terms of changing that, that's probably likely to require legislative change. So, whilst the committee can um, make make a, you know make a direction on an individual basis, you know, does the committee want to to look at? Um, you know, whether they say um, that as a matter of policy, because they want to follow what the, the joint working group has said, that their intention would be that any, any complaint that came that was not, uh, that was over a year old, that a direction would be issued to the to the commissioner um, to look at that. So those are the kinds of issues that I'm talking about. There'll be some things which, presumably, if it's just a, a change to the code of conduct, take a lot less time to do, because you will obviously have to inquire into that, produce a report, and that's for Parliament to, uh, to, to agree on. On. For issues where legislative change is needed, that will obviously take a lot longer. And it's to look at whether there might be things that you might be able to do through directions or through changes to the, the code um, that can that can help in the intervening period until such time as um, legislation can be changed. But on something like that, we'd need to be make, we'd need to make a decision first and put into place the legislative change process before, as a committee, we would put a transitional arrangement in because we would have to have agreed with the the report. Is there anything else, though, that 
that you think should be transitional at the moment while the committee are deliberating rather than coming to a conclusion? I mean, as I say, in terms of, of timing, we always appreciated that um, we were going to be able to put in place a policy but that might not, we might not by that point have been able to change the code of conduct in terms of the, the complaints against members. Ultimately, what we would like to do is to have to be able to have this policy in place and to have everything in place. Now, as, as we said at the beginning, um, we will hopefully have this policy finalised by March. Now, whether this, you, you know, whether this committee will have been able to take decisions by that point as to whether the code of conduct should be changed by March, I, I don't know. Certainly, if there's going to be legislative change, that would definitely not happen within that that time scale. And I suppose it's really just. For, for your committee to decide that if you do agree with the recommendations of the, the joint working group and if you know that some legislative change will be needed to do that, you know, is there something that you could do in the intervening uh, period to send out a signal that says, we have this policy, we know there are changes that will have to be made um, down the line, but this is what we want to do going forward. Okay. Thank you. Thank, you, um, thank you very much indeed, uh, both to Susan Duffy and Vicky McSherry. Um, that was quite an intense uh, but, uh, amount of work, but you covered it extremely well and were extremely useful to the to the committee. Thank you. I hope that the committee's questions have been useful uh, to the joint working group as well, and I wish you all the best uh, going forward with that and for Christmas New Year as well. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that's us at the end of the public session, so if we can clear the gallery, please. <laughs> right, OK, thank you. <laughs>